Okay. Yeah, yeah. This but is yeah. scary. This one to show, yeah. Like, is that like a chocolate milkshake that you're drinking, Ross? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> Actually, we should. Beer. I think that's homemade. Like that. Gotcha. <laughs> you remember? You know someone, uh, I remember. He didn't make it. Just a mystery, mystery custom code. It might have been Ben Lawrence. Uh, so yesterday night, Ross, John, and I were watching, uh, we were just watching some Daily Wire. And Jeremy <laughs> Boring, who's the CEO of the Daily Wire, mm. immediately gets into it and says, we're very pro-vaccine. Um, but despite us being pro-vaccine, we don't, we're going to legally battle and fight the vaccine mandate out in court, which I thought was super interesting. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think about that? I've seen like a lot of actually Republicans come out and say that like, while they do support like vaccinations, they maybe have gotten the vaccine. They're against mandations, which I think is kind of a cool thing to be able to see. The thing that isn't talked about too much is that you either have to get the vaccination or you can test your workers once a week, which means it's a little bit less than a vaccine mandate. I, someone on Twitter was like, well, what if it was, everyone has to test once a week, but you can get out of it if you get the vaccine. And what if you had instead flipped it the other way? I think it would have been called the vaccine mandate anyways, but I think it might've been smart for Biden just to say, everyone has to get tested once a week or you can get the vaccine. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, like at the essence, it would still be the same thing. It would just be like the wording difference, yeah. which it, it would be interesting to see what the the chaos would be from that, I guess. Not chaos, but um, blowback, blowback, because I know some people who right now are refusing to go to places that like just ask for a negative COVID test. Personally, I'm fine with submitting a negative COVID test. It doesn't bother me, but I do know some people who even like just with that requirement will boycott businesses or won't go to things or mm -hmm. et cetera. There's an interesting, there's an interesting thing though about, so like uh, from more smaller government folks and conservative folks, the big backlash is that this is not only like a slippery slope, but I think Emily, you talked about this yesterday, but it's like the straw that broke the camel's back. But I was, I was reading this op-ed in the New York Times. I just put in the chat where it talks about how actually, um, and I don't think, I think the title's definitely exaggerated, but it's like America, vaccine mandates have been uh, a American tradition. I don't think that's the case, but it actually identifies two big mandates historically that um, have happened, one with smallpox and the second one I can't necessarily remember, but there have been big sweeping examples of government intervention in the past that don't lead to like what Ben Shapiro today was calling, which is Biden is the COVID tyrant. Um, but to, to be fair, the, the article's title is vaccine mandates are American and so is the backlash, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that's something that, you know, it's easy to look back on and miss is that there was backlash. I also, now this is, it's unsighted. I don't have the citation for you, um, but there was a claim that during the smallpox vaccines that people were actually breaking, like people would go into homes, like force their way into homes and vaccinate people um, because the, the country thought it was of such a priority that they were forcing it on their citizens. And in 17, you know, 70 or 80 something, I could see that happening and there was probably big blowback against it, but we don't look at that anymore, right? And I, I'm, I think the thing I keep turning back to is the seatbelts. People are like, oh, what if seatbelts were mandated in 2021? People would push against it. It's like, yeah, that's what happened is that people are super angry that they had to wear seatbelts. Now we're fine with it, but I, I think the reaction is, is always going to happen. But in a way, nothing good Nothing good ever happens without some reaction. Yeah, I, I definitely agree and see like the parallels. And I'm definitely not someone who's like saying, oh, we've never had this before. But I think what's part of the conversation that's missing is that we do have countries, which I just like dropped in the chat with Israel right now. They have some of the highest vaccination records in the world and they're going back into lockdown because cases are surging. So I think it like, begs the question of where do you where do we actually draw these lines now um because for me personally is it are we drawing these lines based off of cases or by the mortality rate based off of the john hopkins 
recent um, mortality rate, and I'll actually like pull up the exact thing so I don't misquote it. In the U.S., it's 1.6 percent. Good. Which is extremely good. It's extremely yeah. low. We can argue that that's because of vaccines. And I would say that, yes, it is partly because of vaccines. And I've been doing like a lot of reading into this by diff several different epidemiologists, especially the, he's an epidemiologist at Harvard. I can't remember his name, but he's been advocating for an approach that is taking into consideration already natural immunity because studies are actually showing that natural immunity is is posing greater immunity to the Delta variant specifically. They don't have studies yet on the Mu um, variant, but they're saying that if you had COVID and you get the vaccine, then you have like basically this like Goldilocks version of immunity. So it's not that I'm like anti-vaccine, I'm just pro-holistic science of looking at this from if we really want to actually move away into normal society. That means acknowledging that people, a lot of people have had this virus and have recovered. Yes, it's, um, there's natural immunity. And yes, like the, for example, with Israel, we've had massive vaccinations, but there's massive COVID cases as well. The big risk in a lot of this, which I don't hear, honestly, a lot of the discourse talking about is not necessarily that people that, um, have the vaccine are going to like die or whatever. No one's arguing that. I think the bigger issue is that the COVID virus itself evolves and it, it sort of, it becomes and mutates into a variant that our current vaccines don't cover for. And so like my biggest fear with not, with having a large unvaccinated population, our population is pretty unvaccinated. I think there's 80 million people that are unvaccinated currently, it's like 25% ish. That like, that poses a pretty substantial sample size just within ourselves and that's not even the entire world for the virus to mutate to the point where it's not that people are dying but it mutates and becomes even stronger um well i mean if if israel is 100 percent vaccinated and they still are seeing a boom in cases then vaccines evolving and mutating is going to happen in that place too the the difference though i'm reading this uh article the challenge in Israel is not that the vaccine is not, it's not, it's not that everyone's vaccinated. The challenge is that there's waning immunity and that they are need to administer the booster shot. And so, which, which yeah. isn't necessarily an argument against vaccines. It's just an argument that you just need to get the booster shot. Yeah. I mean, which means that we're just, we're going to get the COVID vaccine like every six months, right? For the rest of our lives. I can see that. I mean, it would just basically be like the flu shot every year, which, I mean, I just got mine yesterday again. So I feel like if that were to be the case and we were supposed to get it like every year and it just became kind of the norm, then that's totally fine. But I also feel like the goalposts keep moving in a way, or it's very easy to continue moving the goalposts because we had regular COVID or whatever that first variant was. Then we had the Delta variant. Now we have the mu variant and it's like, who's like, there's going to probably be more variants as more people just remain unvaccinated. So it's kind of like, are you just going to keep imposing mandates um, when there's always something new coming? And then like, how are you going to combat that by adding more like mandates or requiring, requiring vaccines more often? Or like, what does that look like? I think um, as it keeps mutating and that's kind of what I'm stuck on is like, if you do that and then something else happens, it's like, oh, well, now you also have to do this and this and this. And it's like, where's the line drawn? Like, when are we actually going to stop and say, we've actually made progress on this? Like, when is it, when is it going to be okay to not have these kind of mandates? I, you know, I, I was hoping that there would be an end to COVID. And you know, I'm a little conspiratorial by nature, but I also, I mostly think our government is trying to protect us with the, <laughs> yeah, with the vaccine. The um, and so I get why it's a little bit scary for people like, oh, you know, the government wants me to take a shot every year and for like a flu vaccine, you don't have to, you know, you're not mandated to do that. Just a lot of people go into that, but I, I, I'm almost reserved to the point where there is no post COVID, you know, there is no post flu, right? Yeah. There, there is no post cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I think it, it a little bit more like that than like, you know, like we're in a forever pandemic 
because I don't think that that's actually necessarily what the disease has been like either. But. I, I think like going off of that, I did a lot of like, kind of, I was curious about what flu like case fatality rates were. Yeah. And in 2018, um, it was 1.8% um, for people 18 through 49, 48.7% for people 65 and above. That's like Morta a huge What, what percentage? Uh, are you talking about mortality rate or? Yeah, mortality rate per, per the CDC. Per case. Yeah. How many people die per case? Is that what you're looking at? Yeah, it's the, I would have to don't i'm gonna pull it i had it pulled up earlier let me see I'm gonna I don't want... this. if you ever want to look at the real data then you have to literally search through giant csv files yeah it's crazy it's so tough to actually look at unless unless you trust the unadulterated analyses of the data and the csv files uh, like right now ross this was per 100 the influence of mortality rate during the 2018-2019 flu season in the United States. So it was the rate per 100,000 population. So 48. Who, yes. Who yeah. got it or who died once who, they got it? Who died. Mortality rate. So that's, that's where I'm saying is that we're seeing similar numbers, but we don't have like a general flu vaccine mandate. Something to be made abundantly clear. I'm pro vaccine. I think the vaccine is an amazing accomplishment. If you are someone who a just flat out wanted the vaccine, b hadn't had COVID yet and you don't have natural immunity, c were elderly immunocompromised or any of those groups, I think that this was an amazing innovation. But I do not think that it should be forced on people who just don't want it for whatever reason, which is the same way that we treat the flu vaccine. We can say, you know, you weigh your pros and your cons, you weigh who you're interacting with, and then you choose and you make a decision based off of that. The, the two thoughts I have there, one is that if the problem with COVID is that it wasn't fatal enough. I think like, to your point, if you have a more deadlier disease, like, and people see their people dying, they're going to, they're going to change. Like, it also like, doesn't spread as much. Yeah. Like when people are dying. Th that's but. the, that's the big thing is like COVID was the perfect pandemic virus and that yes you might have more, more uh, fatal diseases but they burn out um scientifically the second piece of that which is the precedence thing and this is something that like i always uh i understand theoretically the argument that the government intervenes here there's a precedence but historically there have been a lot of instances of mandates and there isn't this like tyrannical state um like i'll give you an example the new york times article that i sent earlier um it specifically talks about, quote, um, but in the 1890s and 1900s, when they were trying to vaccinate smallpox, squads of men would enter people's homes in the middle of nights, breaking on doors if necessary to inject people with smallpox vaccines. The government's res response was literally to force people to take the vaccine. Like, that, that's, my, that's my thought around just all the rhetoric around precedence and slippery slope is that there rarely is actually a slippery slope. I mean, to be seen though, I would say that that's kind of where the slippery slope started though, is that now we are citing that as like, that was okay in this time because, which I would say, I would argue that smallpox is way more deadlier than COVID and the, the mortality rate for the virola major virus um, is around 30%. So that's huge. Yeah. So I, my problem is, is that where are we drawing these lines? Like when are we saying that something like that is okay? And when are we saying that that's not okay? Because I think the slippery slope that we're seeing is that we do have countries like Australia who are on very, very strict lockdown yeah. in yeah. the name of public health, but also like, are we looking at the numbers of huge rates of alcoholism, drug abuse, opioid addictions, um, mental health, depression, Suicide, the suicide rate in the UK for children was five times higher than the child death rate, child deaths caused by COVID. Oh. So we have to like be looking at this like holistically of like every single one of those lives that's lost in the pandemic, whether it was from alcohol substance or opioid addictions or even domestic violence, like those are all tragedies. So I think we, we have to compare like 
all of these things into making these decisions. And I would also just like to say, I'm very glad that I'm not in a position of power where I have to be contemplating this. I think we all have a privilege to just talk about it and like make decisions. We're not talking. I make these decisions. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> You know, I listen to a lot of people from both sides and, and we were watching Stephen Colbert last night and I was like, wow, this is so cringy and like so political and, you know, but I listen to also a lot of people on the right and the thing that absolutely ticks me off about people on the right, is people like Ben Shapiro, Tucker Carlson, Donald Trump, even all these figureheads have had the vaccine. They've all had it, right? Because they know that they need to have it. And yet, what they do is they come out, you know, and they say, I can't, they, they say this little disclaimer at the beginning. They're like, I super support the vaccine. I think it's the greatest accomplishment of modern science. Everyone should get it who wants to get it. But the fact that the government is going to force people, and then their point is always, if you're going to force people, they're never going to want to take it. But the reality is these people have a giant platform and they're unwilling to advocate for the vaccine to their audience because they know it's going to turn their audience off. Donald Trump is booed at a rally when he when he asked people to take the vaccine. And all of these right wing pundits are, in my opinion, tucking their tails and not talking about it because they're scared about losing money when they know that they could literally save lives by telling their audience to take it. And then they complain about Joe Biden mandating it. And that just that pisses me off a lot because it seems like a willful, kind of a conscious decision that I don't actually care about my audience's life. What's kind of interesting about that too is I've seen the narrative on Twitter specifically like shift from actively opposing or actively like not going with the mandate, like just because it's being mandated. So people are like actually like opting out of even potentially considering getting the vaccine just because it's like in retaliation to what the government is saying, which I think is a kind of, in a way, I feel like the Biden administration kind of shot themselves in the foot by doing that because you automatically just like pushed away a huge segment of people that had you approached it differently might have actually considered it. And now they're actively again, like refraining and absolutely just not going to do it. Can I just say the politicization of the vaccine has been so odd for me from the very beginning. We had people when the Trump administration was doing Operation Warp Speed saying that they weren't going to get the vaccine. Kamala Harris. Yes. And Joe Biden. We wonder why we're in a position where people are hesitant to take something when we've seen a flip-flop of the narrative so many times when it's molecularly always, always been the same thing as far as we know. Don't quote me on that. Um, the, the both sides of flip-flop both sides have flip-flop and that's where my main concern is is that both sides have politicized this vaccine I agree with you Ross to an extent I haven't listened to I don't listen to Tucker Carlson so I can't say and I don't listen to Ben Shapiro either um but the I agree with you that's what I'm saying um well I can't agreement has been reached <laughs> Bridge USA. We did it. <laughs> I would say that it's like the the rhetoric behind it just needs to be, in my opinion, is that if you do the cost risk analysis for yourself, or you haven't had it, or if you feel like if you do get it, then maybe you have several comorbidities that you could present with possible other side effects. Then, like, get the vaccine. Let's go back to normal lives. The problem that I have with it is that we've seen so many goalposts moving and so many political rhetoric around COVID that I just think people don't know who to trust. Just one one quick thought there, just I wanna bifurcate. And I think um, just when you say goalpost shifting politicization, I totally agree with the politicization point, but I think the, like, the, I would actually be nervous if the goalposts weren't shifting on masks or they weren't shifting on vaccines. Because the idea of science is you're learning new stuff. Like no one knew in March what the virus is going to be. I actually think like if from the start they had a policy and just said, this is the policy, no matter what was happening, like they had to have known Fauci and the other folks that are making COVID policies, like they had to have known and they were, I'm sure they were scared like when they said masks, then no masks, then but I think from their perspective, they were trying to elicit transparency, but they also had moments of not having transparency. And as a result, 
it confused and confuddled the policy. I feel like it's a little bit different though when you're telling people that this is like the be all end all thing. I think that's what the saying is, is like, if you're told that after you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear masks and people are like, heck yeah, I'm gonna get back. Like, this is my first step back to normalcy, but then they were required to wear masks again, or it's like that you have to get a third booster shot. And so I feel like there is a danger in moving the goalposts. I totally understand what you're saying, Manu, but like in promising that this next goalpost shift is going to get us to the end of it and we still haven't seen a real end in sight, like that kind of false promise, I think, is what's dangerous there. And I, I think Fauci has come out and said like, hey, I know we told you this, but that's kind of because we needed everyone to do it, even though it wasn't maybe totally true. I don't have the exact citation on that, but I'm yeah, sure you can go yeah. find it. And I think I get, whereas, you know, if you're leading children, you say, hey, you act good because Santa's going to come right and not you act good because you don't want to you know piss your parent off but I think when you're a, a government official like I'm a little bit torn on that in, in some ways I'm like yeah just get people to do what they should do and in other ways I'm like you should totally be truthful well okay here's the other thing is that I don't feel like our public health policies are actually evolving with the science of this virus I think instead we're actually putting our feet in the ground in areas where we shouldn't be putting our feet in the ground. So I think the end all be all is that people don't know who to trust. Do you trust the WHO? Do you trust the CDC? Do you trust your governor? Do you, in a way, do you trust big pharma with the vaccines? I think there's a lot of people right now who feel like they're being pushed into a corner and they feel like there's whether or not this is a reality or not i'm not saying that it is but i think they feel like cards are being hidden behind people's backs and i think that's why we see this aggressiveness on both sides about it um if there are not any like last comments i have one question for you guys to kind of wrap this up i'm curious do you guys think that people who are unvaccinated should have more restrictions imposed on themselves Honestly, I, I haven't thought about it too long, so maybe this is just off the cuff a dumb argument. Mm -hmm. But I think, I mean, you, what, it, almost everywhere, over 95% of current hospital, hospitalizations are unvaxxed, and that, mm -hmm. that's the same with deaths. And I've been this way for a little while, and, and maybe it's not the way you make public policy, but if you don't want to get vaccinated, do what you want. You're you're taking you're taking a much larger risk as far as dying of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's your that's your additional restriction. It's the the final restriction. I would say that if I I would agree with Ross's stance. I think that individuals have to be able to make the choice for themselves about what they're comfortable with. I think people should talk to their doctors, their personal physicians, and consult with them to make a decision. But I do ultimately think that it should be their personal decision to make. Um, and you do, you do have the risk. You have the risk factors that you have to consider for yourself. To reword the question really quick before Manu answers, I kind of mean like restrictions as far as like job restrictions or like entering business restrictions. Like, do you think those kinds of things should be imposed harsher on people who remain unvaccinated? I would like a quick amendment then if I may. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't ask it right the first time, but that's kind of what I was trying to get at. Uh, businesses, you can hire who you want. You can let a customer be who you want. I mm -hmm. think if you're going to work for a place, I mean, I understand that might mean that a lot of people lose their jobs and we should hopefully try to find a way to, to let them have their jobs. But if you're an employer, you get to hire based on, on a health status. So you can't hire based on disability or not hire based on disability, um, mm -hmm. but right? Mm -hmm. Disability yeah. is a protected class. Disab yeah, yeah it's disability like a little... is a protected class. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I stand by that. It's a business's right to reserve who they want to serve, who they don't want to serve, who they choose to hire, who they don't choose to hire. My problem is, is when the government tells the business who they can hire and who they can't hire, mm -hmm. hire or what stipulations that they can operate in that. Um, I would also say that 
when talking about a field right now, like the healthcare field, that's already experiencing shortages. People need to be very careful with those decisions because yes, I understand that vaccines are mandated in hospitals, but also you can get a flu um, exemption from getting the flu vaccine yearly and you just wear a mask. At least that is for um, Arizona hospitals. So I think people have to realize that for every action, there is a following consequence and we have to be able to weigh those consequences, whether you're an unvaccinated person or if you're a business that, that is trying to enforce this. There is so much historical precedence for government telling businesses what to do. Civil Rights Act, the idea that you can't discriminate employees, like the historical precedence for government intervention in businesses is just there. Um, but that's not, I don't think that's like the broader debate here. I think the my big thought on whether or not unvaccinated people should get uh, re specific restrictions is solely based off the fact that there's a real risk the virus mutates. This is not just like the unvaccinated choose to die, so they die. It's that all the rest of us might get screwed again, because the virus mutates to a point where Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J just don't cover it. And that's my big fear. And so I think that if you're unvaccinated, you're making the decision to basically um, uh, engage in sort of what I would think is irresponsible behavior, but that's your right. Um, thought I just had when Ross was saying about business rights and whether or not, like, I agree that businesses should be able to do what they want. Alternatively, what if the government came out and said, like, you get a tax credit or tax break for every employee that gets vaccinated? I think that is a great idea and it avoids the lifetime supply of ivermectin. And as a the, result, wait, question, the businesses would get the tax. Yes. Credit? Yeah. So every employee you back, you, you, so what I would say is that, um, or you could say business or people, I would say the business part, people. because what I would say is that let's say you're a, a business above a hundred employees. I would say that if your business above hundred employees, I don't know, I'm just making this up and you mandate a vaccination, you get a tax break as a business. Um, that's what I wouldn't go off the individual, like the individual gets a tax break. That's all. Yeah. I think you should do both because the individual then has an incentive and business has an incentive. Otherwise businesses will just fire people who don't get vaccinated because they're not getting their adequate tax breaks. But if you do individual plus business, both gets a tax break because of vaccination, you incentivize both. I would be very interested to see whether or not people put their money where their mouth is, especially it the unvaccinated folks that think that like they're like, if they're like, okay, suddenly you get a thousand dollars off or like you get a thousand dollar stimulus check if you vaccinate yourself. Like I'm very interested to see whether or not their resistance would still hold up. You see that in Ohio did a lottery. These are lotteries. Yeah. Just explicitly like yeah. you get the job, you get a hundred. Like No, I know, but I'm saying that I would agree that those incentives would work. I think my final thought on that, though, is it's pretty bold to assume that people are willing to compromise their health potentially just for a little payout. Um, so saying we'll pay you money if you do this, but there's no guarantee that like your body will take it or that you're not going to have to do it again, I think is kind of a bold and risky move. All right. Well, go ahead, good talk, friends. This was good, good talk.